We're going to continue with live coverage now as we take remarks from U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley discussing U.S. policy toward Iran. She's at the American Enterprise Institute here in Washington. This started just a couple of moments ago. Revolutionary students overran the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. In violation of international law, they held 52 American Marines and diplomats hostage for 444 days. For the 38 years since, the Iranian regime has existed outside the community of law-abiding nations. Henry Kissinger famously said that Iran can't decide whether it is a nation or a cause. Since 1979, the regime has behaved like a cause, the cause of spreading revolutionary Shiite Islam by force. Its main enemy and rallying point has been and continues to be what it calls the Great Satan the United States of America. And the regime's main weapon in pursuit of its revolutionary aims has been the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IRGC. Soon after the revolution, the IRGC was, cre was created to protect the revolution from its foreign and domestic enemies. The IRGC reported not to elected government, but to the supreme leader alone. Soon after its own creation, the IRGC founded Hezbollah to spread Iran's influence and its revolution abroad. Then came the bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut in 1983, 63 Americans killed. Then came the bombing of the Marine Barracks, 241 Americans killed. Mm -hmm. Then the kidnapping and murder of CIA Station Chief William Buckley. In 1985, a TWA airplane was hijacked. The body of a U.S. Navy diver was dumped on the runway at the Beirut airport. In 1988, U.S. Marine Colonel Robert Higgins, a U.N. peacekeeper in South Lebanon, was kidnapped and executed. Under the IRGC's direction, Hezbollah then expanded its lethal reach to Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Americas in search of victims to kill. In 1994, a Jewish community center in Buenos Aires was bombed, 85 killed. In 1996, a truck bomb blew up Kabar Towers in Saudi Arabia, 19 U.S. airmen killed. Throughout the Iraq War, the number one killer of U.S. troops was improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, the deadliest of which were supplied by the IRGC. Thousands of American men and women were wounded or killed. In 2005, Lebanese Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri was assassinated. In 2011, the U.S. disrupted an IRGC plot to bomb an American restaurant less than two miles from here. The target was the Saudi ambassador. Today, Hezbollah is doing the Iranian regime's dirty work, supporting the war crimes of Syria's Assad. And it is building an arsenal of weapons and battle-hardened fighters in Lebanon in preparation for war. This is the nature of the regime and its quest to overturn the international order. Its power and influence has grown over time, even as it remains unaccountable to the Iranian people. It's hard to find a conflict or a suffering people in the Middle East that the Iranian regime, the IRGC, or the proxies do not touch. In parallel with its support for terrorism and proxy wars, Iran's military has long pursued nuclear weapons, all while attempting to hide its intentions. For decades, the Iranian military conducted a covert nuclear weapons program undeclared and hidden from international inspectors. In 2002, Iranian dissidents revealed the existence of a uranium enrich enrichment plant and heavy water reactor, both violations of Iran's safeguards agreement with the IAEA. The regime went on to break multiple promises to abide by international inspections and limits. It hid its nuclear weapons development and lied about it until it got caught. In 2009, American, British, and French intelligence revealed the existence 
of a secret uranium enrichment plant deep inside a mountain, deep inside an IRGC base. The British Prime Minister sub summed up Iran's behavior well, calling it, quote, the serial deception of many years. It was soon after this that President Obama began negotiating a deal with Iran. The deal he struck wasn't supposed to be just about nuclear weapons. It was meant to be an opening with Iran, a welcoming back into the community of nations. President Obama believed that after decades of hostility to the U.S., the Iranian regime was willing to negotiate an end to its nuclear program. Much has been written about the JCPOA. I won't repeat it all here. Let's just say what the, that the agreement falls short of what was promised. We were promised an end to the Iranian nuclear program. What emerged was not an end, but a pause. Under the deal, Iran will continue to enrich uranium and develop advanced centrifuges. We were promised any time, anywhere inspections of sites in Iran. The final agreement delivered much less. The promised 24-7 inspections apply only to Iran's declared nuclear sites. For any undeclared but suspected sites, the regime can deny access for up to 24 days. Then there's the deal's expiration dates. After 10 years, the limits on uranium, advanced centrifuges, and other nuclear restrictions begin to evaporate. And in less than 10 years, they have the opportunity to upgrade their capabilities in various ways. The JCPOA is therefore a very flawed and limited agreement. But even so, Iran has been caught in multiple violations over the past year and a half. In February 2016, just a month after the agreement was implemented, the IAEA discovered Iran had exceeded its allowable limit of heavy water. Nine months later, Iran exceeded the heavy water limit again. Both times, the Obama administration helped Iran get back into compliance and refused to declare it a violation. If that's not enough, the biggest concern is that Iranian leaders, the same ones who in the past were caught operating a covert nuclear program at military sites, have stated publicly that they will refuse to allow IAEA inspections of their military sites. How can we know Iran is complying with the deal if inspectors are not allowed to look everywhere they should look? Another major flaw in the JCPOA is its penalty provisions. Whether an Iranian violation is big or small, whether it is deemed material or non-material, the deal provides for only one penalty. That penalty is the reimposition of sanctions. And if sanctions are reimposed, Iran is then freed from all of its commitments that it made. Think about that. There is an absurdly circular logic to enforcement of this deal. Penalizing its violations don't make the deal stronger. They blow it up. Iran's leaders know this. They are counting on the world brushing off relatively minor infractions or even relatively major ones. They are counting on the United States and the other parties to the agreement being so invested in its success that they overlook Iranian cheating. That is exactly what our previous administration did. It is this unwillingness to challenge Iranian behavior for fear of damaging the nuclear agreement that gets to the heart of the threat the deal imposes to our national security. The Iranian nuclear deal was designed to be too big to fail. The deal drew an artificial line between the Iranian regime's nuclear development and the rest of its lawless behavior. It said, we've made this deal on the nuclear side, so none of the regime's other bad behavior is important enough to threaten the nuclear agreement. The result is that for advocates of the deal, everything in our relationship with the Iranian regime must now be subordinated to the preservation of the agreement. The Iranians understand this dynamic. Just last month, when the United States imposed new sanctions 
in response to Iranian missile launches, Iran's leaders threatened once again to leave the JCPOA and return to a nuclear program more advanced than the one they had before the agreement. This arrogant threat tells us one thing. Iran's leaders want to use the nuclear deal to hold the world hostage to its bad behavior. This threat is a perfect example of how judging the regime's nuclear plans strictly in terms of compliance with the JCPOA is dangerous and short-sighted. More importantly, it misses the point. Why did we need to prevent the Iranian regime from acquiring nuclear weapons in the first place? The answer has everything to do with the nature of the regime and the IRGC's determination to threaten Iran's neighbors and advance its revolution. And that is where the other two pillars that connect us to the nuclear deal come into play. The second pillar directly involves the United Nations. When the nuclear agreement was signed, the Obama administration took Iran's non-nuclear activity, the missile development, the arms smuggling, the terrorism, the support of murderous regimes, and rolled it up into UN Security Council Resolution 2231. Critically included in this supposed non-nuclear activity is the IRGC's ongoing development of ballistic missile technology. You can call it non-nuclear all you want. Missile technology cannot be separated from the pursuit of a nuclear weapon. North Korea is showing the world that right now. Every six months, the UN Secretary General reports to the Security Council on the Iranian regime's compliance with this so-called non-nuclear resolution. Each report is filled with devastating evidence of Iranians' violations. Proven arms smuggling, violations of travel bans, ongoing support for terrorism, stoking of regional conflicts. The Secretary General's report also includes ample evidence of ballistic missile technology and launches. The regime has engaged in such launches repeatedly, including in July of this year, when it launched a rocket into space that intelligence experts say can be used to develop an intercontinental ballistic missile. They are clearly acting in defiance of UN Resolution 2231 by developing missile technology capable of deploying nuclear warheads. Unfortunately, as happens all too often at the UN, many member states choose to ignore blatant violations of the UN's own resolutions. In this way, we see how dangerously these two pillars of Iran policy work together. The international community has powerful incentives to go out of its way to assert that the Iranian regime is in compliance on the nuclear side. Meanwhile, the UN is too reluctant to address the regime's so-called non-nuclear violations. The result is that Iran's military continues its march towards the missile technology to deliver a nuclear warhead, and the world becomes a more dangerous place. That's where the third pillar of our Iran nuclear policy comes in the corker Cardin Law. As you recall, President Obama refused to submit the Iran deal to Congress as a treaty. He knew full well that Congress would have rejected it. In fact, majorities in both houses of Congress voted against the deal. Among the no votes were leading Democrats like Senators Chuck Schumer, Ben Cardin, and Bob Menendez. Despite President Obama's constitutionally questionable dodge of Congress, the legislative body did attempt to exercise some of its authority with the passage of the corker Cardin Law. The law requires that the President make a certification to Congress every 90 days. But importantly, the law asks the President to certify several things, not just one. The first is that Iran has not materially breached the JCPOA. That's the one everyone focuses on. But the corker Cardin Law also requires something else, something that is often overlooked. It asks the President to certify the suspension of sanctions against Iran, certify that the suspension of sanctions against Iran is appropriate and proportionate to Iran's nuclear measures, 
and that it is vital to the na national security interests of the United States. So regardless of whether one considers Iran's violations of the JCPOA to have been material, and regardless of whether one considers Iran's flouting of the UN resolution on its ballistic missile technology to be non-nuclear, U.S. law requires the President to also look at whether the Iran deal is appropriate, proportionate, and in our national security interests. Corker Cardin asks us to put together the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. Under its structure, we must consider not just the Iranian regime's technical violations of the JCPOA, but also its violations of Resolution 2231 and its long history of aggression. We must consider the regime's repeated demonstrated hostility towards the United States. We must consider its history of deception about its nuclear program. We must consider its ongoing development of ballistic missile technology. And we must consider the day when the terms of the JCPOA sunset. That's a day when Iran's military may very well already have the missile technology to send a nuclear warhead to the United States, a technology that North Korea only recently developed. In short, we must consider the whole picture, not simply whether Iran has exceeded the JCPOA's limit on uranium enrichment. We must consider the whole jigsaw puzzle, not just one of its pieces. That's the judgment President Trump will have to make in October. And if the President does not certify Iranian compliance, the corker Card law also tells us what happens next. What happens next is significantly in Congress's hands. This is critically important and almost completely overlooked. If the President chooses not to certify Iranian compliance, that does not mean the United States is withdrawing from the JCPOA. Withdrawal from the agreement is governed by the terms of the JCPOA. The corker cardin law governs the relationship between the President and Congress. If the President finds that he cannot certify Iranian compliance, it would signal one or more of the following messages to Congress. Either the administration believes Iran is in violation of the deal, or the lifting of sanctions against Iran is not appropriate and proportional to the regime's behavior, or the lifting of sanctions is not in the U.S. national security interest. Under the law, Congress then has 60 days to consider whether to reimpose sanctions on Iran. During that time, Congress could take the opportunity to debate Iran's support for terrorism, its past nuclear activity, and its massive human rights violations, all of which are called for in the corker Cardin. Congress could debate whether the nuclear deal is, in fact, too big to fail. We should welcome a debate over whether the JCPOA is in the U.S. national security interests. The previous administration set up the deal in a way that denied us that honest and serious debate. If the President finds that he cannot, in good faith, certify Iranian compliance, he would initiate a process whereby we move beyond narrow technicalities and look at the big picture. At issue is our national security interests. It's past time we have an Iran nuclear policy that acknowledged that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You've given us an enormous amount to talk about, and I'm going to use the mic as I always do to ask a, a first couple of questions. Sure. Um, so, you were just at a Security Council session that was called urgently in the wake of a potential uh, hydrogen bomb test in North Korea. Now, you're talking about Iran, a, a different challenge, but in many ways, the same kind of a challenge. I mean, how do you? Do you see the possibility that Iran ends up in a North Korea situation if more is not done in the coming months and years? I think that's why it's so important for me to talk about this, because I know that if we continue to not look at the Iranian activity, if we continue to just say, oh, we'll deal with that later, 
we will be dealing with the next North Korea because we're allowing them to go and develop advanced technology right there in front of us. We're allowing them to have behavior that's in violation of the resolution right in front of us. We're allowing them to sit there and actually tell the IAEA they are not going to let them inspect military sites where we know they have had covert nuclear operations in the past. So what I want the country to understand is we need to wake up. We need to understand this is not something that just suddenly went away. It is still there but it's hiding behind an agreement that has everyone so scared to touch it without realizing things are going on right now. So you spend a lot of time with our allies and, and others uh, up, in, up in New York. One of the things that you hear from, from Iran and, their, and their, their friends and supporters is if the United States chooses to walk away from the JCPOA for whatever reason, the Europeans and the Asians and the Russians are not going to be with them. You're going to be walking away on your own, and we're not going to put sanctions back in place. As you, as you lay out you know, your concerns, as you talk to people up in New York, where do you see our allies standing on this? I think our allies are frustrated, and they are concerned. They see what we see. They see the violations of the UN resolution. They see the fact that the Iranian regime is saying they're not going to let us look at military sites. They're concerned. Everyone hoped that this deal was going to make the Iranian government good people. But no one looked at the history of Iran. No one looked at all the past aggressions that they have shown. And what we're saying is this deal doesn't change all that. And this deal doesn't change what's happening right now. So our allies very much know that we should be concerned. No, they don't want us to get out of the deal. But this is the thing. Are we going to take care of our allies and making sure they're comfortable? Or are we going to look out for our US security interests? That's the thing. This is about US national security. This is not about European security. This is not about anyone else. This is about the president making a decision on are we, is this in our national security interest to continue down this path that we're on? So one of the things that got the Iranians to the table were the sanctions that, that you mentioned that really took a bite out of, out of the Iranian economy. Uh, the challenge for us then is if the assessment is that in fact they are not complying, that this is no longer in the U.S. national interest. How do, we, how do we constrain them? This is one of the conversations that a lot of people have in Washington. We focus a lot on the JCPOA. Okay, it's a lousy deal, but it was a carefully constructed one. What happens next? Have you, have you started talking and thinking about what's next? Well, I mean, I think we have to understand you can't put lipstick on a pig, right? So no matter what we do, we can't make this deal look better than what it is. We have to look at the reality that this deal is flawed. So do we allow ourselves to have blinders on to a flawed deal? Or do we say, what else can we do? Is there something else we should be doing now to prevent what's going to happen 10 years from now? Because that's a very realistic thing that we need to look at. That's important for our children and our grandchildren and everything going forward is that we can't continue to kick this down the road. We have to make sure that we're looking out for it. And I think that if you look at North Korea now, the reasons we're pushing for so many sanctions you know, do we think more sanctions are going to work on North Korea? Not necessarily, but what does it do? It cuts off the revenue that allows them to build ballistic missiles. With what we did with Iran, we cut off the revenue so that they couldn't improve their technology. We cut off the revenue so they couldn't do bad things willingly as much as they wanted to. So instead, we gave them this influx of money that suddenly allowed them to do whatever they want, with 24 days notice, if we're going to inspect a site, I mean, there's a problem there. And I think we just need to be honest with ourselves that when the JCPOA was passed, when the resolution was passed, when the Corker Cardin law was passed, that doesn't change the Iranian culture and belief of the government. They are still who they were prior to the deal. Now, one of the things that you mentioned that we don't talk about enough, I think, is that there are a whole array of other Security Council resolutions that affect Iran that are not nuclear related, not just the missile, uh, not just the missile technology, but also the transfer of weaponry. So, and you obviously mentioned Hezbollah. 
Do you think that there's support out there to start putting pressure on the Iranians who are now in Bahrain, in Yemen, in Lebanon, in Syria, you know, and uh, we could go on for a while. Do you think that, there's a, that there is a growing consensus that we need to do something about Iran's other activities, or is this going to be us standing alone again? So this is the interesting thing. The Iranian, um, you can look at any place in the Middle East where there are problems and the Iranian tentacles are there. It's just the reality of the situation. So if you know that, if you know that there's proof of support of terrorism, if you know there's been arms smuggling, if you know that they're in violation of multiple things from that resolution, why isn't it anyone standing up? They're not standing up out of fear that the Iran regime will pull out of the JCPOA. Now, how smart is that? So we're going to ignore all of these things they're doing throughout the Middle East in the name of protecting a flawed deal? That's not smart. It's not being careful. It's not being in front of the situation. What we are looking at is we are not keeping Iranians from doing bad things. We're empowering them. And we gave them a ton of money to do it. And so we can't expect any different behavior. And they will do exactly what they did when I went to the IAEA to have conversations. They will threaten to pull out of the JCPOA. They are threatening the entire world because the entire world thinks the JCPOA is untouchable. But it's not. And what they're doing is happening with or without us. And we have to be realistic about that. Absolutely. I want to open things up to everybody for questions. I'm sure pretty much everybody's familiar with, <laughs> familiar with the rules. Please put your important statement in the form of a question and <laughs> raise your hand. I'll call on you and, just, and if you would be nice enough to identify yourself and wait for the mic. Uh, Michael Rubin from AEI. Thank you very much, Governor. Um, Ambassador. Yes, thank you. The question I have is, did the JCPOA encourage and embolden the reformists in Iran? Are the reformists in Iran sincere, or are we caught up in a game of good cop, bad cop when it comes to Iranian politics? Thank you. So it's a great question, but I don't know that I have the answer to it. But what I do have the answers to is the historic nature of the Iranian regime. If you look at how they've been in the past, they have always threatened the United States. They have always done bad activity. They have always been involved in terrorism. They're not going to change their stripes just because of a deal. So what we did is we gave them a deal. What do Iranians typically do? They sidetrack the deal. They find other ways. They get creative. What we know is they have hid things in the past, and they've lied about it until they've gotten caught. This is the same scenario. Yes, the IAEA is doing a great job looking at declared sites. There are hundreds of undeclared sites that have suspicious activity that they haven't looked at. So are we just going to go and, and covet and protect this deal and ignore the fact that reality is they could very well be cheating like they've done many times before? And that's why I think the United States needs to have a conversation about are we being smart to ourselves or are we being played for fools? There's really a, a, a bigger question here, though. It's not, you know, we talk a lot about Iran. We talk a lot about the bad things that they're doing. But there is actually the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty that, that stands in the balance as well. well. We have North Korea. We have the Iranians. We have Pakistan. We have all these other countries that now have nuclear weapons. And if the IAEA is basically a toothless tiger, then you have to ask what purpose this is all this is all serving. I don't think the IAEA is a toothless tiger. I think they actually do very good work. They do inspections. This was a lot to give them. This was a lot. You've got the fact that there are hundreds of sites. Their experts can only look at so many, and they have said of the sites they've seen, those are in compliance. No one's talking about of the sites they haven't seen. That's the talking point that gets missed. It's easy to say, oh, but they're in compliance. Well, that's easy for me if I'm asking my son, did you finish your homework? And he says, well, I finished the first page. <laughs> it's not all of the homework. And so that's a lot of what we're talking about as we deal with this. At least, please. Uh, 
Hi, Ambassador Elise Hi. Labot with CNN. Um, nice to see you again. Um, I'd like to put this in the context of North Korea. Right now, you're, you know, yesterday you said that North Korea was begging for war. Um, today, you're talking about, um, you know, it seems as if even though you're talking about um, the president making his own decision, you just did lay out a, a very um, strong argument for decertifying and re-examining the deal. And I'm wondering, right now, as you look towards North Korea and try to get North Korea to abandon its um, nuclear ambitions, whether there's a concern that um, the U.S. is not counted on to make good on the deals that it does reach with other countries and that North Korea will see um, no incentive to make a deal with uh, the United States if it's going to pull out of its deal. And, and just as you laid out this case, I know you said that the president um, will make the decision. Are you recommending that he decertify? Because you certainly seem to um, lay out a persuasive argument for um, decertifying and triggering this um, nationwide debate. Thank you. So I think there's a couple of things there. I'm not making the case for decertifying. What I am saying is, should he decide to decertify, he has grounds to stand on. That is basically all I wanted to do was put out the facts, because I think it's very easy to just talk about compliance in the JCPOA. But there's so much more to the story that we need to be looking at. And there's so much more that the president has to be looking at. And so what I am doing is just trying to lay out the options of what's out there, what we need to be looking at, and knowing that the end result has to be the national security of the United States. It's protecting Americans so that they aren't in danger to threat. Now, you, you talked about North Korea and, and whether others would think that we don't stay in a deal. What's more important is we let others know we will stay in a deal as long as it protects the security of the United States. We should at no time be beholden to any agreement and sacrifice the security of the United States to stay in agreement and say that we'll do it. We should always let every country know, whether it's North Korea, or Iran, or anyone else, that we will always look out for our interests, our security, and make sure that it's working for us, not making sure that it works for everyone else. That's very important. Of course, the other thing that people forget is that if the president, President Obama, had submitted this as a treaty to the Congress, then we would be much more constrained in our ability to, to walk away. He chose not to do that, understanding that he probably wouldn't get ratification. But if there's anyone to blame for the fact that now Donald Trump can make this decision, it is, in fact, the previous administration. That was their call. And it would be interesting to see what the debate in Congress would be like when they have to look at everything, when they have to look at all aspects of Corker Cardin, when they go and look at that, do they still agree with the agreement? That would be an interesting debate to see happen. Have you encouraged the Congress, members of Congress, and Senator Corker, uh, Mr. Royce, and others to hold these kind of hearings in the run-up to, to this decision? I have not had conversations with congressional members. This really was um, something, because we discuss it at the United Nations quite a bit, um, because by instinct, I tend to try and get in front of situations before they get bad and look at things that might happen before they happen. And because I wanted to make sure that I provided as much information to the president on the issue as I could, um, going to the IAEA, asking the right questions, seeing we never asked the IAEA to do anything. They are independent. I didn't want that to happen. What I did do was ask questions. How many sites? How many have you looked at? Are they declared? Are they undeclared? What about the military sites? Are you checking those? All of these questions needed to be answered. And I think it all goes back to what Director General Amano said in the very beginning. This is a jigsaw puzzle. You can't look at just a few of the pieces and think you know the answer to the puzzle, because that's not the case. Interesting. One Arvind second. Ch wait for the, wait for the microphone. Hello, Armin Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question that if the president decides to decertify the, uh, the agreement and Congress has this debate, would the European allies support where we're going if they understand what's happening? Or would you expect resistance from them uh, moving forward? 
I think because the European allies understand the concerns we have with Iran, if they saw the president decertify, they would, yes, realize that this is going to Congress, and I think they would watch that debate very closely. No one wants to get out of the deal out of holding out hope that the Iranians will do the right thing. But I think we have to be honest enough to say, but what if they're not? What if they're not doing the right thing? What if we just gave them 10 years and all the money they wanted to do whatever they want to prepare for when that 10th year hits and they start nuclear war? And so I think our European allies understand our concerns. I think that they would very much understand the debate. I think they would have their views on whether we should stay in or not. That's going to go on. But I think they very much would understand our willingness or want to have a debate on whether this is still the right thing. And surely after the refugee crisis of this last summer and the previous summer, they understand the costs of allowing Iran to meddle in the region with a free hand, which is really how Absolutely. the Iranians seem to feel. I think we're going to have time for one more question back there in the corner. Uh, wait, just one second, please. Gardner Harris from the New York Times. Um, Ms. Ambassador, this administration has now thrown the Dreamer and DACA to Congress. It's not a debate Congress wants. It sounds like you want to throw the Iran deal to Congress, which I can tell you right now, even your allies on the Republican side will tell you is not a really a debate they want to have right now on Capitol Hill with all the things they're going on. This administration has the power to decide to stay in the deal or get out of the deal. Why this middle path where <clears throat> you decertify and then force Congress to make this hard decision for you instead of making that hard decision yourself. And, and when I talk to the European allies, they say very clearly that they want this deal to continue. Do you really think that you will be able to persuade them if you get out of the deal to create an, another sanctions regime when their message during the debate was uniformly that they would not do so? Thank you for the question. First of all, um, this is not just a middle-of-the-road situation. That's U.S. law. Corker Cardin is U.S. law. And what it says is the president is obligated to make the decision on whether this is still in the U.S. national interest. What the law says is the president has to relook at this every 90 days. So that's not us trying to sidestep. That is U.S. law, and that is law that the president has to follow. And in good conscience, for all Americans, we should want the president to honestly reevaluate every 90 days to make sure that if things have changed, we're moving accordingly, and if they haven't, we're not. I get that Congress doesn't want this. This is not an easy situation for anyone. It's not easy for the president. It's not easy for the Security Council. It's not easy for Congress. But our lives are not about being easy. Our lives are about being right. And we have to make sure that every decision we make is right. And I know, yes, I agree with you. The European allies want us to stay in the deal. But how many attacks did I just describe in history has the Iranian regime gone against Americans, our soldiers, our diplomats? The Europeans can't say that. They're now having to deal with that. But again, our job is not to make sure that Europeans are happy with us. Our job is to make sure we're keeping the American public safe. That's a heavy price to pay to just try and stay in a deal. I am not saying this should go to Congress. I'm not saying we should get out of the deal. I'm not saying anything in terms of what should or shouldn't happen. What I am saying is we owe it to ourselves to look at every aspect of this deal and understand that this was a flawed deal and understand that this flawed deal has negative consequences as well. Ambassador, you have a tight schedule, and so I'm going to thank you on behalf of thank the entire you audience. Thank you very much. would be nice enough to stay seated while the ambassador leaves, then, then you can run for the door as well. Thank you.
Wrapping up with U.S. U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley on Iran's nuclear program from the American Enterprise Institute this morning.